If you want to crush your quota, you're in the right place. My first year in sales, I sold $758,000 on a $150,000 quota, and that was just the beginning. I'm your host, Mary Grothy. I'm a former number one B2B mid-market SaaS sales rep turned CEO. I've sold millions in revenue, broken multiple records, and now I run a company that rebuilds revenue engines and creates top sales performance. This isn't a show about achieving quota. This isn't about being okay in sales. This is about being number one and learning what it takes to crush your quota. I decided to use our platform today for something way bigger than I ever thought I could be a part of. If you've been following us, which I know you are all such a loyal fan base and audience of ours, so you've probably seen me in this video that's been circulating the internet about cross purpose. This is the Quota Crusher podcast. And quotas don't just have to be assigned to for profit companies and salespeople getting to win their crystals and awards. Nonprofits have quotas too, and they have goals. Turns out theirs are typically a little bit more meaningful. I don't know. Some of you might argue that, like, your tech SaaS product is life changing. In fact, you may use that in your marketing messaging. But I'd like to argue that this quota crusher episode being dedicated to somebody whose quota is to graduate 200 families out of poverty every year. And there's a goal of 800. You know my story. In my first year in sales, my quota was 150,000. I sold 758,000 in my first year. Accomplishing and beating that number by 400 plus percent set the tone for the rest of my career. There isn't a challenge that I don't think I can conquer and take on, but this one's gonna take something bigger than me and a lot more community support. And I don't believe that I should have to bear the weight of doing this by myself. (laughs) So I am coming to you in a way that I'm uncomfortable. I'm obviously at a loss for words. I've never asked anyone for money in my life. I chose to steal food I chose to steal clothes before I asked someone for money in my darkest moments. I've never felt like anyone should give me a dollar that I didn't fight or earn. So this is really uncomfortable, but I figured that I could have some friends on the show today. (laughs) They can help me because they get to do this for a living. So maybe they're not as freaked out by it as I am. But here's the premise for this. Quota Crusher podcast, we've taken on a new goal. You all know we split our brand into two. We have salespq.com with our Quota Crusher podcast, blog and training room. Now all of our revenue scaling work falls under houseofrevenue.com where we are doing our work for CEOs who are looking to scale. Jason Jans, CEO of Cross Purpose, is one of those CEOs looking to scale. His quota isn't, oh, I'm going to go be a millionaire. I'm going to scale to uh, fill in the blank and revenue dollars and clients and customers with all this ARR. And I'm looking for this $50 million exit. This isn't his heart. Jason's heart shifted after years of being a pastor and being in the church scene and realized there's something more to the word than what we sit in a church pew and listen to. There's the ability to be the light and to further the kingdom. And sometimes we have to just go in onto the street. We have to go into the community. We have to go to the people and show up. There's something that pulled in his heart to say, it's time to sell our house, to move into the middle of five points, to enroll my kids in Denver public schools in the number one worst rated school in the state or the city, to invest in that school, that environment, to fix things you and I take for granted, like having AC in a school. I mean, it's like over a hundred degrees in a classroom. They, the kids are, they're sweating, they're smelling, they're probably falling asleep in class. Like who can even learn in that environment? And he put his kids in there because he said he was committed to solving this problem. Somebody, uh, my, my pastor, I heard this sermon who said, if you, sque- if you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. If you squeeze a Christian, do you get Christ? Or do you get a whole bunch of BS? If you squeezed Jason Jantz, you're gonna get Christ. And this is a man who put himself in the neighborhood. He loves his neighbors. In fact, loved his immediate neighbor, helped her graduate from poverty And now she's his boss. So that's pretty cool. We can dig more into that story. But I fell in love with Cross Purpose 
This is an organization that has about a three or three and a half month program to take low wage or minimum wage workers who are employable, but have been stuck in these low wage or minimum wage jobs. They maybe don't have a path or the, the social capital or network to get a career. They may have never been exposed to it in their life. They may have circumstances that are keeping them from being able to do that with an easy path, like maybe you or I had. And he helps them get the career development, the personal development and the training and the mentorship and really just the love. Like when is the last time you looked at someone who was hurting and in an environment where they just couldn't get out of this repetitive cycle of the woe is me and the negativity and constantly draining down. Sometimes it's just a shift in perspective. When's the last time you went and you found someone in that position and you just decided to love them for a day and show up for them in a way that maybe no one else was showing up for in their life instead of judging them. But he sells his house, he moves into this community, enrolls his kids in the worst rated school. He loves his neighbors. He develops this nonprofit. He is now graduating 200 families a year out of poverty we have an opportunity, our House of Revenue team has an opportunity to do a six month, maybe more project to help them scale from one location to four. Normally this costs about $200,000. We're gonna to try to do this as close to cost as possible. We'll see the scope of the project. We get to kick this off uh, here in a week. It's probably gonna be at cost closer to about 100 to 120. We've raised 8K to date. We need, we need some help. The last thing I'm going to say on this, because apparently I have a lot to say, if you were moved by any of the social issues that hit and just like bubbled up to the surface, holy cow, 2020, what the heck, right? Not only do we have a virus and a pandemic, all of a sudden, Black Lives Matter focus on minorities and inclusion and diversity and removing barriers for people. I've never seen a social movement like it before, but so many of us, myself included, say, but how can I help? What do I do? I mean, I could sit here and bark on social media and just fuel the fire and rage and argue with my neighbor, or I can either figure it out, roll up my sleeves and do it myself, or if that's not what my heart is called to do, you can donate and give to the people who are and to help further that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to quit rambling. And I'm going to welcome both Jason Jeans to the show, as well as we have a very special guest that I just found out right before we started our show. We have Darren Valdez, who is a graduate. This guy, he got a scholarship in 2014. Jason was his ally and mentor. He graduated the program in 2015. Very quickly after that, became part of the alumni program to help and assist others in the program, then became a coach to the coach of that program, goes out, starts his own nonprofit, initial pitch night, raises four grand, just closed a grant for $165,000. He is now a mover and shaker, but you will not believe his story. And he's here today because I obviously ramble. I'm super over passionate. I think people sometimes think I'm too salesy. And so I'm done selling, like go donate. You can find the link on our webpage, anywhere our social handles cross purpose, but we're going to hear from the people that matter the most. So first I'm going to turn it to Jason. Welcome to the Quota Crusher podcast. Wow, Mary, that's so powerful. Thank you. Uh, I, I get to see you in action here. So <laughs> thank you for the kind words and the great intro. And thanks for sales bq and house of revenue taking us on to help us go to the next level we want to be an excellent a nonprofit that helps our neighbors with excellence so i think sales bq and house of revenue has that reputation and we're just honored to be able to partner in this way well look we're not turning back now so it's gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> um on that note i want to hear anything else on your story that you want to add that i didn't that you're really feeling compelled to share about this mission, but ultimately I want to know how you serve these families. Yeah, I think it just began, uh, you know, personally, we actually all have some poverty in our life. And, you know, we think of poverty in, in economic terms, but poverty, there's a lot of people that have a poverty of spirit, right? Or they have a poverty of relationships uh, or they have a, they have a poverty in their health. And, you know, there's, there's these, these vacuums in our life. And I just had a poverty of meaning. And spiritually, I was just not finding a connection with my existence and my calling to help people and how I was doing it. And so I need to, this started by me trying to solve that poverty 
in my own life. And I think when you walk into to a neighborhood and you actually walk in realizing that I have I have poverty that needs to be solved versus just like answers for those that don't have it, right? I think that changes your posture. And so uh, I went on a search for meaning and my wife, her she had her bags packed before I did <laughs> and our four boys. And, and uh, we've been on this journey for the last 15 years and it's been the greatest journey of our life. And we found, um, you know, our poverty has been abolished in this area. So like, I don't struggle waking up in the morning wondering why God created me. I know. And so then that actually was given to me by the neighborhood. So we said, we're, we we came down to really start a church, but then we said, we want to do a deep walk with the poor. And my co-founder calls it to save our own souls. Hmm. That's kind of where it all began. So when you, so that I think changed everything. And that meant that the neighborhood had something to teach us. So while we're trying to help people get out of economic poverty, they're helping us get out of this spiritual poverty or poverty of meaning. And that created this partnership and a reciprocity without paternalism, right? That says, mm-hmm. hey, we're, we're all in this journey of life together. And then you got to learn how to like work together because there's a lot of stereotypes and a lot of misconceptions, a lot of judgments. And, you know, that starts with me. And that all had to get detoxed, you know, out of my life. So I would just say that, you know, all we're doing now is you already told the story of my neighbor. And I just realized through, through actually bridging social capital, mm-hmm. uh, not financial capital, social capital and connections, was able to get her to this point where now she's the senior manager at FedEx. And, um, you know, her daughter's a basketball star and travels around the country <laughs> playing ball. She just got nine news play of the week. Yes. Um, and, you know, but but moms being the mom, she always wanted to be to her daughters. And so that's extremely rewarding. Uh, But, you know, Tiffany taught me about the neighborhood. And so it's been this really symbiotic, loving relationship. And so all we're really trying to do is scale that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just how how do we do that with 800 people? How do we find 800 Tiffany's and 800 people like Jason and get them together and form this family and boom, love pops out and people's lives get changed. So that, that's what we love. You know, I, I had a moment in my life. I've actually had uh, three, I think I can remember a little more vividly, where I was so empty and so lost on why I was created and my purpose on this planet that I didn't even fully feel the will to live in a way where I would cry and say, why don't you just give my life to someone who has meaning? Like a mom of four who's battling cancer and loses her life. Like, why do you have me here? And you're not saving her. I had points in my life, but to the world, I was so wicked successful. I have all the crystals. I could point to them on my bookshelf. My ego still can't let those go. But I worked so hard for those. I climbed the ladder. I was the number one rep. I made hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and I was dead on the inside. And I used to just pray and say, why did you create me to be so good at selling payroll? (laughs) Like this isn't what you made me for. And I just felt meaningless. And I wanted to give my ticket on this planet to someone else who I just felt had more meaning. And that was a, what you just said, I I wonder if how, how much that resonates with other people. I've thought multiple times, I need to just get my life up and go my career up and and this path in the marketplace and go into ministry. And God so quickly corrects me to say, your ministry is in the marketplace. So walk this path with me, figure it out. And being able to be a part of something that is this meaningful, um, it's huge. So I just love hearing that part of your story. I think it's so impactful. So tell me, uh, specifically this program it's is it three and a half months am I understanding that right and what's the construct of the program how do you serve these individuals and really where does the change happen yeah so essentially uh, it, it takes the average person probably about five months to finish the program uh, but they can get done anywhere from between three and six months okay they have up to six months to finish it you know we start with um, first of all selection so uh, we offer, one of the best opportunities for people to get a entry level career job. And so it costs us about $25,000. Like it would cost us to send someone to see you for a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're going to invest that. And I learned real up, up front, the, like you, you can't help people just who need help. You have to help people who really want help. And so we have a selection process where we take only 10% of the people that actually fill out an interest form and say, I want to join that program. 
and we're really not vetting for any type of background or resume or pedigree. Uh, we really just want to know, do they want it? We're vetting for motivation. And so once we get those selected, right, we let them know you're in the top 10%. Like you, we've done this with thousands of families and you're mm. in the top, they, and they smile and say, mm. now only 70% of those will graduate. So it's like tough because you're, you're going through a life transformation. You're not just a job search, right? So we start with then six weeks of soft skills and hard work. That's just, uh, you know, simple things like resume and mock interviews and things like that. But there's actually a lot of trauma people have gone through in their life. Oh, yeah. And so if we don't help them heal the core wound of their heart, they will just go into a job and their boss might say a cross word to them and they flip out and lose their job. They're back in poverty, right? So we have to actually go back to go forward. So we do a lot of heart work, ID development, uh, giving them all the personality tests that the middle and wealth class tend to get just by nature of being who they are. And by the time they're done with that six weeks, then, then they pick a career path. So they pick one of 20 different career paths Jeez. that they can enter that will pay $17 an hour or more upon graduation. Uh, and then that's done by third parties. We do, uh, we work with several educational providers via laptop and online learning. And then they have a month to go get the job. And so we just, you know, we pummel the job market. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of employee partners, but we won't graduate them until they actually get the job and we now say they are out of poverty. We do not help people in poverty. That's 99% of nonprofits. We help people get out of poverty. Mm. That's the game changer and that's multi-generational and you can't really calculate the impact. We, we do know for our donors uh, that for every person get out, that every dollar they give us, there's a $6.50 return, both on the taxes they're now paying into the economy, the earned income that they're making and the decrease of government benefits that they now have because they're oh saving gosh. Like you're solving the real problem. This is brilliant. I think about how many people have frustration. You hear these terms thrown around like, oh, government handouts and all this archaic system and they're just fueling it. And it's like, okay, fine. Look, here's somebody who's changing the narrative and doing something different. And the thing that stands out to me so much that I absolutely love is you get people placed with employers that care about career progression. And it's not just a dead end job without any growth opportunity. This is a, well, you talked about social capital and you have these employer partners and you have people that were, are very open and interested in meeting these individuals and uh, interviewing them and potentially offering them that job. There's also this, this hope and promise of having an employer that's going to care and nurture for these people, probably in a way they've never experienced. When I was 22 years old, I was in an abusive marriage to an awful man, which was just a product of my raising. So I married what I knew at a very young age. I didn't have a college degree. I was a college dropout. I was working, I don't know, three or four part-time jobs that some maybe were questionable. And I just had no future. I thought I was just going to get married at 21, have kids and be the barefoot, pregnant, abused wife who never got a degree and I never did anything with my life. Although I would argue that I think I'm a pretty cool mom. So even in that scenario, I may have been a really cool mom and had some purpose there, but that was my future. That's what I had. And I could just feel this fire inside of me. Like that doesn't feel right. Like, I feel like I can do something more. I had straight A's in high school. I was such a good kid. Like, why am I living through such, such dark years right now and making such bad decisions and I just felt so called to find any job. And I interviewed with a Fortune 1000 payroll and HR company, no experience, no nothing. I showed up for an interview. It was the first time I bought a suit. I bought a a suit at Kohl's, like on the clearance rack. And I didn't even know how to dress professionally. I had never set foot into an office. I had never done a professional interview. And I don't know. I think that was the good grace of God. But in that moment, that sales manager was like, yeah, I think you have potential. We're going to give you a shot is $13 an hour. And I felt different. I just felt different from that day. But like you said, I had so much that had to heal on the inside. Mm -hmm. I had such a broken, awful childhood and I still am healing from some of those wounds. Thankfully they're a lot better, but in that moment of time, like I didn't have anyone guiding me or helping me heal during that. I had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I had this new excitement in this new world, but the greatest thanks that I have to that manager specifically, my peers on the sales team and that company was they gave me everything to succeed. Who who was the catalytic relationship that you think propelled you for? They believed in you. 
What was that relationship like? Who was it? It was my sales manager. Honestly, he just looked at me differently. Okay, so he, he, so we say there's no significant change without a significant relationship. And yes. that's essentially what we do with our mentors. We call them actually allies because we don't like the paternalism of mentorship as much, mm. especially in low-income communities. But you had an ally who believed in you mm -hmm. and breathed life into a depleted soul. And that you can't get from a government program, right? That just happens no. neighbor to neighbor. And so we have now over 400 people who volunteered as allies and all they do is sit there and they look at people differently, right? That's they, all that it was. I, I believe in you, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the doubt that I had in myself, the fear that I had in myself, he didn't see any of that. He only saw potential and promise and a bright future. I didn't have the same lens. Have you gone back to him and told him the impact he had on you? Oh yeah, oh, he knows. Good. He knows. He knows. So magical. So you're just turning around, Mary. All you're doing is you're turning around, just doing that for now 800 people, right? You're saying, I want to oh, yeah. show them I can believe in them. So here to the families that we don't know yet, that haven't even applied for this program yet. We're going to share a story. Darren's been so patient. He's like, guys, quit <laughs> rambling. I have so much to say. Darren, you have an amazing story. In our brief chat before we started recording, I, I just felt like, I feel like I need to say this before you share your story. I had a really crappy upbringing. I was not destined for anything good based on the way that I was raised. You had a good upbringing. You had a lot of promise and opportunity. And I think a lot of us can empathize that whether it's us, our friend, it's a child of ours, you focus so much on the upbringing and the raising of your kids and being good to your friends. But really poverty is just a few bad decisions away from where you are today. And maybe sometimes not caused by you. Look at this economic climate right now, look at COVID. People are losing their jobs left and right. Industries are just flat shutting down. Um, some people are in positions they've never found themselves in before. So sometimes things happen to us, it's how we respond. And if you don't have the resources and the know-how, or if you're making a series of bad decisions coupled with that, could be substance abuse, could be um, being in an abusive relationship, it could be a lot of things. You put the right recipe together, you too can find yourself in that position. So Darren, I'm really encouraged to hear your story. I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you. So thank you for having me on this. It's such a such an honor. Um, I loved hearing your story, Mary. Um, and that reminded me a lot of, you know, my parents, they grew up poor. They, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and um, they worked so hard their whole life to get us through good education and help me go to school. And I went to Regis uh, uh, High School, which is very expensive for them to put me through. Uh, I went to University of Colorado Boulder, which is very hard for them to put me through. And I went to the business school and I was doing so, so I had so much promise. And um, what I didn't know is how to, how to handle addiction. And uh, it, it runs in my family, but um, you know, they, I'm the oldest of 10 kids. So I had every opportunity that you can give in the world. And I, I gave it away. I, uh, I made horrible choices with my life. Just graduating college, I started working in a bar and um, you know, that life continued for about 20 years. And um, where it took me was, um, you know, I spent seven years living on the streets of Denver I had been addicted to mess. And um, I remember sitting in those alleys, you know, I, just looking up into windows and seeing families together. And I was too embarrassed to go home. I was too embarrassed and shameful. And I told my mom, I remember I sent her one email and I said, I'll come home when I'm successful. Oh. But that day was never gonna come. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't contact her for that seven years, except for that one time. and. I broke her heart. So how can you go back? Um, and what happened was, you know, God stepped in and, and, and he tried over and over again to get my attention. But finally I was falling asleep for one, one evening. Um, and I was, I messed away to a hundred pounds missing oh. teeth, and I was falling asleep under the stairwell and being covered up with snow and a voice inside me just said, I need you to get up. I need you to get up. And, um, I walked nearby to this hospital just to get warm. I thought if I get snuck in the corner that they wouldn't notice me, right? And I mean, I was one of those alley people that, that, that has 12 backpacks and just is a mess coming in. And 
instead of chasing me away, a woman walked over to me that was working on the front desk because she brought me some hot coffee. And she said, you know, she just started talking to me with a kind, kind voice. And she just showed me love. And she asked me one question. She goes, why don't you go home? And a million people have told me that before, but I, I didn't hear it. And I looked up and I saw the title of, of the hospital I was in was Rose Medical. And that was the hospital I was born in. And something clicked. Um, so I decided I was gonna go home for Christmas. And um, a friend drove me up and, you know, they hadn't seen me in quite a while. And I, I paced out front, not knowing if, if I was going to be chased away or yelled at or whatever. And I rang the doorbell and my whole family was there and, and they parted the way and my mom was just sitting there crying. And it was, it was beautiful. Um, but addiction is not that forgiving. Um, in my mind, it's, it's, you know, it's such an evil force. And uh, I had to go get high that, that night. I couldn't handle that kind of emotion. I couldn't handle that love. And it took a good another month before I finally gave in and I, I went home. And I was staying with my parents and, and they were they were okay with me staying there. They were just glad to see me and I was alive. And I was telling my mom, okay, mom, this is what this is my plan. This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. And 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 I not realizing I had done this a million times before to her. And I look over and she's just in tears. And, and she looks up at me and says, Darren, and a mother's not supposed to see her mother, or her, her son die. And something shifted. I made, I, made a, I made a commitment in that moment that I'm never gonna break this woman's heart. And uh, you know, we looked for treatment centers all throughout, all throughout the city and, and everywhere we looked, there was just no beds available, familiar story. Um, and uh, we had one place that, that, that responded. Um, it was Sobriety House in Denver. And they said, we have one bed available, but you have to really give this a real shot, right? Um, and my brother flew in from Minnesota and helped me pay the initial fee to get in. And I was, I was crazy. I, meth really puts you in this paranoid universe and, and you don't trust anyone. And it was, it was just horrible. But something about that place, they just started loving me. Like they, they listened to me. And, and I started hearing about this thing called a higher power and, uh, I didn't know what that was. I was like, I know God and, and, and I don't think God's very happy with me. Um, so how can I ask forgiveness? Well, I guess that's not the way God's love works. And, um, you know, he brought a wonderful man in my life, uh, my sponsor, and he started teaching me how to build a relationship with God and, and how to uh, commit to that and live a, live, live a life of honesty and, and trust and, and open-mindedness and, and willingness and, um, you know, I'm doing really well. I'm, I'm, I'm going to meetings, I'm, I'm having a good time. And then, you know, I, I graduate the program and I have no job. I have no job experience over the last 10, 15 years. I, I have a business degree back in 94, but that's not <laughs> gonna help me right now. What am I gonna do? And so my sponsor says, why don't you just go start volunteering? And I volunteered at a place called Same Cafe and uh, just sweeping and for, for lunches between meetings. and. I saw a flyer on the on the wall there and, and it was for cross purpose and um, all it said was are you looking for a second chance and i'm 42 years old <laughs> who's going to give a 42 year old man who's a meth addict a second chance um and i didn't i didn't want to respond and, and my counselor i did grab the number and i talked to my counselor about it she said why don't you just tell him everything why don't you just put everything on the table and and, and see what happens so I wrote this long letter to them and I said, I, I really, really like it a second chance. And um, they interviewed me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they gave me a call and they said, you're exactly what we're looking for. And so they helped pay me pay for school to go to Emily Griffith. And they said I could choose whatever I wanted, which is amazing. And I cho chose video production and I uh, went to school and I, I did projects for Cross Purpose and I did a, a, a little a documentary on Same Cafe and it was amazing. And when I graduated, I was volunteering at the, the Emmys, the local Emmys and the executive uh, director over at uh, PBS 12 saw me and he says, do you want a job? Now I showed up for this job and not really realizing where it's located. And uh, I show up there and I realized I used to sleep outside this building. Oh my gosh. And, and now they're giving me a paycheck, mm. right? 
and that's not where Cross Purpose stopped helping me. They, they we they they also helped me go back to school for counseling to to for a, a certified addictions counselor, and I got a job at the sobriety house back where I got sober uh, <laughs> as a house manager and a counselor. Um, so I'm doing really well, and I'm like I have to get back, and they're like, "Would you like to be an ally?" You know, I graduated Cross Purpose. I got my little trophy right here. It's one of my most proud trophies I have. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to be an ally. Yeah. And that is the goal of the program. Being an ally with this organization is something that you think you're going into to help people. And then you realize that you're the, really the one that needed help. Like being a part of their lives is just incredible. So I did that for a few times. And, and, and then Jason um, came to all his graduates and he said, I, I got an idea, guys. I got an idea. Jason has a lot of good ideas. <laughs> And he said, I want to, I want to create a different dimension of this leadership. I want, I want, I want our graduates to actually be the ones to, to, to create change in the community because they're the ones that have walked that path, yeah. right? Who better to do that? You don't need a business degree. You need life experience mm -hmm. to actually put in the work. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I didn't have an original idea, but I was working at the treatment center and a, a young man came in my, in my office and he was going to leave and he was, his, his anxiety was out the, off the roof. And he asked me um, for some, I asked him if there's anything that would calm him down. And he said, yeah, do you have any construction paper? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll get you some construction paper. And, and um, an hour later, I go down to the basement and I look at him and he's got the copy straws from the copy machine there. And he's wrapping the construction paper around the copy straws. And he's got these beautiful origami lilies that created a whole bouquet of them, right? And I'm like, he was just smiling. And he said, Darren, this is the only thing I've been ever, ever been able to make that doesn't hurt people. Oh, wow. And so I went to Jason with this idea and I said, Jason, I, this is what I wanna do. I wanna create a, a, a place where people in recovery can go to create art and music um, a place where they feel welcome and have community. Um, I want to be cross purpose for, for addicts, right? I want to be, I want to be that, that space for them to grow. He said, let's do it. Um, and, and we developed a program over six months, uh, a little incubator <laughs> and we created a pitch night, which we didn't know we were going to do that, but we were just flying by the seat of our pants. Like, what can we do? <laughs> and, uh, and we did it. We got up on stage and, and, and I, I pitched this idea and Jason helped me to really kind of um, learn how to get the, the juice of what you want and, and present it. And, and that really helped. And we raised four thousand dollars and uh, it was one of the best nights of my life. Um, you know, since then, I've also been brought on to Cross Purpose to help uh, during COVID. We, we, we lost a lot of our alumni were, were losing their jobs because of COVID mm -hmm. downsizing. And so Jason asked me to come on and help uh, find them jobs and just walk with them and just walk them through this whole process. And, and, and 40 of them were able to get jobs again um, and better jobs. One, one woman got a full ride scholarship to an organization called General Assembly mm -hmm. that was going to help her become a software engineer. Yeah, It was just a perfect fit for her. Right. And now she's got a, uh, a, a, an internship with an organization called Salt Lending, and they're going to give her a full time job right after that. So it's we're not just giving jobs. We're, we're giving futures. It right? isn't. This is just Consider incredible. The, what's the cherry on top, though? You got to finish that last part. Oh, and the cherry on top. OK, so <laughs> I apologize. Uh, the the cherry on top is um, so I've got this this nonprofit going. And uh, we were wait, doing classes. Wait, wait, you started a nonprofit. I thought you just did classes for people in recovery. Oh, so after we got the four thousand dollars <laughs> for the pitch night for this this nonprofit for Colorado Artists in Recovery, um, we did a few classes at, at Cross Purpose, and uh, we had a per per performance night, and they got to sing and they got to to play music, and it was just incredible. And last um, last summer. I, um, I was asked to share my story with a, a local foundation called Caring for Denver. And uh, I wrote my story for them and they ended up putting it on their website, like front page. And I was like, holy cow. And then they reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing a, a grant uh, proposal, uh, open proposal for grants for community centered substance misuse programs that uh, are creative in art. And it was like, it was written for me. Yeah, like that's very specific. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
and that's God, right? And so I'm like, well, I have to do this. And I, I, I'd never written a proposal, but I was like, we'll do it. You know, I went to people across purposes. I was like, help me do this. How do we, how do I do this? And we talked about outcomes and measurements and, 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 you know, all these words that financial fiduciary responsibility, that's a big one. I, I'm, I know what that is now. Um, and it, they were always there just for me to, to bounce ideas off of. And I created this proposal and apparently you don't get the first proposal you ever do, but I did. Wow. And we got it, oh and uh, they let me know in November that we got $165,000 to uh, create this program for the next three years. Um, yeah. How many, how many people will be impacted by that? So, so far we, we have, uh, we, we, we've helped 64. Um, over the three years, we will help over 1,000 people. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. With the end of result, we're, we're going to try to put together a capital campaign for a brick and mortar facility for an actual place for people to go and do these classes all the time. So Mary, I want to make a point here. And that is that, you know, cross purpose is not the hero here, right? All, all that happened through this journey was I just found these like local heroes who may have not had access or opportunity, brilliant people with great hearts that are super generous and just providing the scaffolding around the calling of their life to let them do what they've been created to do. So that, so it's more than a poverty program, right? It's like really taking those who've been through the worst struggles and let them become community leaders and make change. But the ripple effect is unbelievable. I mean, this is, it is not about cross purpose. This isn't about a, a number stopping at, oh, we're graduating 200 families or 200 people a year and we want to go to 800. What's the impact of the 200 you're serving today? What is the impact of the 200 in the community and in their kids and their legacy and in their families and their communities and their neighbors with what they're learning and how they show up different. It's amazing when you can get purpose aligned. I love what you just said, building the scaffolding around it. When someone is purpose aligned, the passion and fire inside of them it, and the, and if, if I may be so bold, but the light that's inside of them and comes out is undeniable it's highly influential it's inspiring to others and then you get those who are led to go down a same impact route through community and being able to have something similar breach off of this i'm sure Darren, as remarkable as the story is i'm sure there are others that have been a product coming out of cross purpose and even if it isn't to this magnitude what are they doing in their lives that's different even with tiffany the mom that she is today forever change the path of her children and her children's children and the people around them. And it's just remarkable to see what happens when somebody can go through this program. I am going to close us out, which will take me like another 10 minutes. Sorry. <laughs> Other podcasts like closing it out. 60 second countdown. No, <laughs> this means we're transitioning to like, the last third. I'm just joking. I'll make it concise. Um, Darren, I, I know you can see it, but I mean, I, I'm just crying listening to your story because I have a son and he's four and a half and he's, he's, he's just, um, yeah, I'd be heartbroken too. And I pray for my son and I think about my son and the responsibility that I have, but I know that God has a purpose and a path for him. And to ever think that my son would feel that he had disappointed me to the point that he could not come home. Oh my gosh. Like it's just so heartbreaking. And I know that it's not just you. I know there's so many people out there that have to work through this and heal from this, but I'm personally just so inspired by your story. And I'm so thankful we had you on. I hope that people can understand. And, and this is why we had to do this because I don't like asking for money and I'm out on social media right now with my 19,362 LinkedIn connections and my other platforms and our amazing loyal listeners at our subscription list and we're blasting this out and we've only raised eight thousand dollars and i know that i'm maybe not getting it right or understanding the reason to the madness behind fundraising but i hope you hear this i almost use the word plea and i don't know if that's good or bad <laughs> our team is committed there's no turning back i told jason that we're all in 
and maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but even if we don't raise the money, we'll figure it out. I'm not turning back, but I'm asking for your help because we're a small business too. And we're just not at the stage that we can gift. I mean, our VPs only have three clients each and I, I can't, give their time to do this work. We're just not mature enough as a business and I don't have the cash reserves, but where there's a will, where there's, there's a way I would more say what it's God's will, then there is a way. And I know that this community needed to hear this message to understand why we're passionate about it and the difference that we're making. So you may historically have known sales BQ and house of revenue to be for-profit companies. We use terms like quota crusher and scaling revenue. And we help CEOs scale to pass their revenue plateaus that we help increase the valuations of their companies. We've helped CEOs exit and get multi multi-million dollar exits and they get to see their dreams come true. That's like one person. When we do that work, this is an opportunity to do work that will not only serve a scale from 200 families to 800, but the ripple effect in every single person that is going to be touched by the people who are forever changed and aligned with their God-given purpose, their talents, and their future, break the cycle of poverty, abolish it, get it out of their life and their kids' lives and influence their neighbors and their loved ones around we have a chance to do something so much bigger than any of us. We have a chance to take our next commission check, our whatever in our savings, our whatever it is that we have and we're feeling led, or we go to our employer, listen to this message, go talk to your SVP or your CEO or your executive team. Are we a charitable organ? Like, do we donate? Are we philanthropic? Do we have a line item in our budget for giving? Is this something that we can maybe shift some of our uh, giving this month and put it towards this cause or whatnot? Um, to the people who have donated to this point, um, I know who all of you are, even the one anonymous person. I know who all of you are. And it just means the world to me that you have shown up with very little information on what this is and what we're doing. And I want to thank those people for taking us to the first eight grand. We get to kick off this project in less than a week. And we're all in. And the request is that you would be all in with us. Darren, Jason, anything that you want to add? Darren? No, you know, Jason talks about uh, one of our core principles is, is expensive love. And I, I, I hear that in your voice. Um, I think that's something that we all as human beings and Christians have to have to really consider is, is why have we been given so many gifts and, and, and what are we supposed to steward? We're supposed to be good stewards of that money. and, and if you find a good organization like this that, that's doing so much work, the people at Cross Purpose, they would do it without a paycheck. They do it for heart. That's why it's one of our, our core values. And all in is also one of our core values. So, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. I'll for piggyback the off of that, Darren. I'll piggyback and say that, like, uh, now when I talk to people, I realize, like, if we keep if we keep going down the path we are as a country, as a world, as a culture, we're going to keep getting the same results that we've always gotten. So actually I want to like up the ask from, Hey, would you contribute to, I say, would you sell your soul <laughs> to help humanity? I mean, we would love your volunteer hours, your brains like that you bring to bear upon the world and the market, your employer connections, your social capital, uh, your financial resources, your volunteer hours, like, <laughs> I, I'm not asking you, I don't get a raise if this happens, right? I'm doing this on behalf of neighbors who I know are like Darren, and there's thousands of them in our city, just like Darren, who need a shot. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the obligation of us to think about that. I like how uh, one of the founding philanthropists of this organization always quoted Warren Buffett by saying, if you've won the embryonic lottery, you have a responsibility in life to give back to those that didn't. And so we all were dealt different decks of cards. We have to all on this call be people who have experienced poverty in our lives. So we know what it's like to have to scrape by or be dishonest to get our, our daily bread, so to speak. Um, but now we're in a different spot. And so all we can do is say, hey, there's, there's thousands of people that, and I guarantee you this, if you give, it'll go to the people that are most likely to take advantage of that opportunity and work their butts off to be successful in our economy and our city. And with that, here's how you donate. You can go to me, 
on LinkedIn. You can look at any of my posts on anywhere social media. You're going to have the link to donate. It is on the Cross Purpose website, and we're going to add a link to it on houseofrevenue.com, and we'll add a link to it on salesbq.com so that you can find it there. If you can't find it for any reason, find me, Mary Grothy, on LinkedIn. Send me a message. Say, send me the link, and, and it I will is, get it uh, with you. It is a gift to Cross Purpose, and we will pay House of Revenue, but it is tax deductible, and we are also a Colorado Enterprise Zone, so if you give thousand dollars we will give you a 250 dollars state tax credit that's not a deduction it's a credit off your taxes as well to help uh, make this happen whoo that's good to know because i donated five thousand yeah. dollars so do i get a thousand dollars 1250 dollar tax credit you'll get from oh. us it'll go right off your state tax bill at the end of the year I'm really glad you can do math that I can't because apparently I was thinking it was 25% and that's 20. Um, and I've said it before, I give anonymously. I never ever talk about where I give or what I give, but I have to lead by example and I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And so I proudly say that I made a $5,000 donation. I proudly proclaim it is not my last donation. And I hope that you can jump on board to this and yeah, get your state tax credit. Woo even better. All right. We're wrapping it up. Thank you both for joining us today. All right, Mary. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Quota Crusher podcast. Did you like it? Be sure to give us a rating and share it with your friends. And don't forget to connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Lastly, if your company needs a boost in revenue, like real revenue growth, send me a message and we'll discuss how our team builds revenue engines for our clients covering all facets like marketing, sales, rev ops, and customer success. Until next time.